Welcome to today's debate for Nebraska Governor. I'm Michael Severe from the Omaha World Herald. And I'm Craig DeGrelli with KMTV3 News Now. We will be your moderators for this hour-long debate. We intend to have a robust exchange of ideas. Let's meet the two candidates first. Governor Pete Ricketts is the Republican and incumbent, and State Senator Bob Chris is a Democrat and challenger. A couple of rules before we get started. We will give equal time to each candidate. We're asking you to keep your answers to about 60 seconds. You'll see the red button or the red light go on on either side. That will tell you that your time is up. When we ask you to move on, please do so. In addition, we reserve the right to follow up, meaning we want to give the candidates a chance to respond directly if attacked by your opponent, and we will do that. So without further ado, let's get started. Michael? We're going to start with the property tax question. It goes to Senator Chris first. Would you support a plan that directed more state income and sales tax towards reducing the property taxes that Nebraskans pay? Please explain. Absolutely. Um, not so long ago, we gave 20% of our income tax to fund education. This past budget cycle, it was less than three. That burden, not funding education, causes a, a, a further burden on the taxpayers, the property taxpayers. We need to find a way to balance that three-legged stool of taxes and reduce the burden on property tax every way that we can. I honestly believe that by going back to a point in time that I remember in 2009, 10, 11 time frame, the balance of taxes that were paid, particularly to education, held down the, balance, held down the burden on the property taxpayer. Okay, Governor Ricketts, tax question for you as well. You have repeatedly said that property tax reform is a top priority, yet it has not happened. Why should the voters trust that you would get it done in the next four years? Well, thank you, Craig. And first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all my family and supporters are here. My lovely wife, Suzanne, our first lady, uh, lieutenant governor's here. I see Governor Orr is here as well as some state senators. Thank you all very much for being here today. And property tax is absolutely the number one issue that people have talked to me about as I've been running for governor five years ago and up until today. And Craig, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit, though, because I think we have. We've increased the property tax credit relief fund in my first year by over 40 percent. In my second year, we came back with uh, a bill, LB 958 and 959. 958 added another $20 million directed toward farmers and ranchers. In fact, uh, Senator Chris was the only person to vote against that bill. In uh, last year, we came back with a bill that would have revalued how we do ag land. And this year, we came back with a bill that was a 20 percent tax cut on property taxes that was stalled again in the legislature. The last two years, both have been stalled by filibusters in the legislature. So I have been working on property taxes every year, have introduced legislation with the legislature every year to get that done. And that's also in contrast to my opponent, who has been in the legislature for 10 years, and the only bill he ever introduced on property tax relief would have raised your property taxes about 263 bucks for an average Nebraska household. Senator Chris, you've been critical of the governor for not reforming property taxes. He says you've been in the legislature for almost 10 years. What do you think you could do to address property taxes from the governor's mansion that you haven't been able to do from the legislature? Well, first of all, there are 49 senators and one governor, and this governor has proposed a bill at least last year that would have given TD Ameritrade and the corporate tax and the highest income earners the largest portion of their taxes, taxes back while it would have put $25 in your pocket, it would have been $13 million for TD Ameritrade. I analyze every bill that comes forward, and I make sure in, in making my decision about whether to support that bill, it makes sense. The past four years, the governor has introduced legislation that takes more and more money out of our ready day fund. That doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense at all. Governor, you want to respond to that? Yeah, the bill that we had this year was a 20% tax cut on your property taxes. It was 10 to 1 property tax relief to income tax week and relief and workforce development. And as my opponent knows, uh, TD Ameritrade is a great company, but my family owns less than 10% of that now. My dad and I haven't been involved in the operations of that in, you know, years. What we actually had on the table was something that would have delivered significant property tax relief, would have more than doubled the amount of tax relief coming from the state to over $4.5 billion over 10 years. It would have been significant, and it was something that got stalled in the legislature. All right, let's move on it to... It was stalled in the legislature, I think, because there wasn't enough consensus building. There was only a bullying to make sure that the bill came forward. Uh, we need to make sure that we build consensus and that it comes out of the legislative process. Okay, let's move on to Medicaid. And Senator Chris, this question is for you. 
A proposal to expand Medicaid to about 90,000 low-income Nebraskans is going to be on the November ballot. You said you support the measure which would increase the Medicaid cost by about $64 million a year when fully implemented. Where would you find that money? Well, first of all, I've been involved with Medicaid expansion and this dialogue for the whole 10 years I've been in the legislature. Uh, the, the prime point here is that over 30 states have already implemented some form of Medicaid expansion using a judicious use of our uh, waiver process, we can find the kind of, of, of uh, support that we need for 90,000 people who are uninsured. 35,000 of those are my fellow veterans. It, it is not going to cost the state that much money, and it needs to be done. I supported the petition, and I will vote for it, and I will help enable it as governor. All right, Governor Ricketts, a uh, similar question. Uh, you said you do not support the measure when it comes to Medicaid expansion. How would you propose to provide health care coverage to those 90,000 people, most of whom currently work? Well, the real problem here with regard to health care coverage is that Obamacare was a failure. You know, President Obama told us we'd be able to keep our doctors, that our premiums wouldn't go up, and none of that actually turned out to be true. Our premiums have gone up. Our deductibles have gone up. And as I travel around the state and talk to people, this is a huge issue, especially for small businesses who are trying to provide those benefits to their folks. The solution has to be that the federal government needs to take this on and in the Congress and working with the president, get real health care reform, something that would make it affordable so people could actually buy it. One of my concerns with Medicaid expansion, and Craig, I actually going to disagree with you a little bit, I think that by the time it gets fully filled, uh, phased in, it's about $100 million to the state. And what that means is that's going to be uh, taking a, the program itself will be moved away from the elderly and the disabled and children that it's actually supposed to be focused on. And the states that have done it have gone vastly over their budgets. And that means that here in our state, it's going to take away money from education, higher education, property tax relief, and roads. The governor's made an absolute statement about uh, states that have funded it, and it's not true. It's many states have not gone over their budget. Google it. Fact check it. It, it is true. We'll stay here with, uh, with you, uh, Governor Ricketts. Uh, we're talking about the death penalty now. Uh, the state has argued in court to keep the source of Nebraska's death penalty drug a secret. Why shouldn't your constituents know where Nebraska gets its execution drugs? Well, when it comes to the death penalty, this is an important tool that we use the state to be able to protect the public safety. And in particular, I think about our corrections officers who we ask to go into our prisons where we know there's dangerous people because we put them there. It also helps protect our law enforcement officers. And so it's really incumbent upon us as the state to be able to carry out the sentences as ordered by the court and the will of the Nebraska people. Remember, Nebraskans voted 61 to 39 to restore the death penalty when the legislature, including Senator Crist, abolished it. And so what we do as part of our state government is we keep the execution team secret. That's to protect their identities. And that's part of what we're doing with regard to all the people that are involved with regard to this process. It's really to protect their identities, and that's why we put the process in place we did. All right, Senator Christ, uh, the governor just noted this. You do not support the death penalty, but more than 60% of Nebraskans disagree with you. Would your administration carry out executions despite your personal objections? I took an oath of office to defend, uh, this, constitu defend this country um, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. When I take the oath of office and become governor, I will again take an oath to carry out the laws of the land. I will do that. However, I will say this. I am pro-life. I am pro-life from, from conception to natural death. And I believe that we need to look at the death penalty issue again. Those 60 percent were the 60 percent who voted in that particular election, which, by the way, uh, I, I will own that vote. I voted to abolish the death penalty, and I voted to override the governor's veto on the death penalty. Check my record. Measure and weigh it. That's where it is. Uh, the death penalty issue has been an, an incredibly emotional issue for many people in this state. And I, too, have traveled around the state. I can tell you that we're not a state. If we are really a state of pro-life, then we need to analyze all phases of pro-life. Thank you, Senator. We're going to go back to Governor Ricketts now about corrections. Uh, Nebraska's prisons remain at 160 percent capacity. Uh, staff turnover remains high. The state's experienced two prison riots over the last four years. What would you do to fix the agency? Well, we need to make sure that our corrections are functioning to protect the public safety. And that's what we've been doing over the course of the last few years. We really 
all know that corrections have been underinvested, so we've asked for investments from the legislature of about $117 million in capital expenditures, plus additional operating expenses to help raise some of our correctional officers' pay and help really stabilize that attrition we've been seeing. And we've seen the results. So for example, we've managed to improve the risk-reducing uh, programming that we have in our correction system by about 25 percent, which has helped us reduce our staff assaults by 40 percent. We ended porn going to our inmates. We've fixed the sentence correction calculation. We've managed to really work on how we get people that tr programming before they reach their parole eligibility date. One of our great programs, the Five Ventures, has had 175 graduates. 25 of those have left our system, 94 percent of them have jobs, not one of them has come back into the system. So we've made a tremendous amount of progress, but we've got more work to do, and that's what we're going to continue to do, is focus on how we can protect the public safety. Senator Chris, question to you, if you were elected governor, how would you fix the agency? I would go back to where we were. I was involved with corrections investigations, special investigations, long before the governor came into office. In fact, one of the first things he did was to abolish and do away with our stakeholders group that we had put together five years before that. We had measures in place that would have corrected both the intake, the sentencing parameters, as well as the correction system. I would again go back to reform those stakeholders and make the corrections that we had initially uh, talked about doing. I also can tell you that there's been more riotous activities, more incidents, more deaths, and more murders in the last four years right. than there have been in the last 30 years in corrections under his administration and under the leadership of Mr. Frakes who will be packing his bags to Washington if I become governor. Governor Ricketts, uh, Scott Frakes, and the job he's doing. Well, I'd like to respond back to the senator. So what the senator is talking about there is LB 605, which was a justice reinvestment effort. And that, I didn't terminate that, it expired. And it had served its purpose. We actually made changes with regard to our justice system. It actually helped <laughs> us flatten out, even take down a little bit our inmates uh, with regard to how many we have in our system. And so it served its purpose. And as I mentioned, we are working on things. We've done things like end the terrible practice of co-incarceration. We're working on expanding capacity. We're working on expanding programming. And we've been successful in those areas. Now, certainly, it was underinvested for a long time. And we've got a lot of work yet to do, but we're on the right track. I, I need to correct the governor. Uh, LB 605 was a statute change. It was not a program that expired. What expired is what he terminated, and that was the installation of a stakeholders group made up of all three branches of government that met almost on a monthly basis to start, actually weekly basis to start out with, and then monthly after that. That group of stakeholders was disbanded because the governor wanted to do it my way or the highway. It's not working. Corrections is a debacle, and what we have right now is a one-third turnover of every corrections officer. 30% attrition. Try to run your business with a 30% attrition. Actually, the center is wrong. What happened was, again, we had this group that was working on the justice reinvestment, and the mandate for that group came to an end. The, the outside consultant that was helping us, they weren't being paid anymore, so they were going home, and that's why that meeting ended. All right, it's time I'll for our first commercial break. When we come back, the candidates will ask each other a question. You are watching the debate for governor in Nebraska on KMTV 3 News Now and the Omaha World Herald. Welcome back to the debate for governor, and it's time for the candidates to ask each other a question. By a drawing of cards, Senator Christ, you go first. Sure, thank you. Um, governor, you've boasted many times about running the state like a business, and I think that you would agree that there are certain things in business that may not want to be um, likened to the running of, of the government. Um, Paul Singer, who's been called the doomsday investor, orchestrated the sale of our own jewel in Sydney, Cabela's. It cost us 2,000 jobs and many, many families who are hurting because of it. Uh, that man gave you a large amount of money for your campaign and also gave your father's pack, your pack, a large amount of money. Um, why did you stand by and let us lose that jewel in Cabela's? and 2,000 jobs. Well, what the senator is talking about is that Bass Pro, a company uh, based in Springfield, Missouri, uh, basically negotiated with Cabela's to be able to buy them. That was something that was done between Bass Pro and Cabela's. They negotiated that. And I didn't have anything to do with that because that's a private sector transaction. 
And part of what we do in government is really create the environment for people to be successful. But it's really up to those private companies to manage themselves and decide what they're going to do best for the people that are associated with their, their companies. What we have done is work to make sure that we've put, for example, the Department of Labor has opened up an office in Sydney. We've recruited companies back to Sydney. In fact, when I was in Canada last year, we recruited Agroplastics to open up a, a, their first U.S. expansion in Sydney so they can employ people there. And we are working to really help Sydney find jobs for those folks who are being displaced by this transaction. And uh, not everybody is, is leaving. We still are keeping some of the functions of Cabela's there. They're still keeping the Cabela's names. But we are working to make sure that everybody that's displaced there finds another job so they can continue to remain in Sydney or in the region. So you're telling the people of Nebraska you had no knowledge as the takeover and the forced sale of Cabela's that cost the state 2,000 jobs? Yeah, that's correct, Senator. I was, I'm not involved in any of that. I'm not on the board of Cabela's. I'm not on the board of Bass Pro. I don't get involved. I'm not involved in any of that. Well, maybe the press can look into it. All right. Uh, Governor Ricketts, your chance to ask Senator Christ a question. Property taxes, we've already discussed, is the number one issue here in the state. It's something that I've introduced legislation on every year that I've been governor, working with the legislature to do that. Uh, it's putting our farmers and ranchers at a competitive disadvantage because ag land valuation has gone up 252%. Senator, you've been in the legislature 10 years. You put in a procedural motion to kill the bill we had last year. You didn't, you were the only vote against the $20 million going to our farmers and ranchers a couple of years ago. And the one bill you introduced into the legislature, LB 468, would have actually gotten the property tax credit relief fund. And for your average Nebraska home of about $150,000, that would have driven that property tax up by $263. Given that you've been there 10 years and haven't done anything on property taxes, why should the people of Nebraska believe you now that you're running for governor, you're actually going to be able to, you're actually going to work on this at all? Well, the fact that you're asking the people of Nebraska to give you four more years means that you haven't done anything in the last four years either. But I will explain my bill. My bill was very clear. It was trying to get everyone's attention to the fact that you're pulling money out of the rainy day fund and giving money back. We are depleting our rainy day fund. It has less than $290 million in there. When I was there in 2009, we had, about two, we had about $800 million going into that recession depression, and we barely made it out the end. We're at a point right now, if we see that same thing again, in the escalation of you taking money out of the Rainy Day Fund and giving money back, we're going to be in big trouble. I introduced that bill to make sure that people understood the ramification of continuing to rob the savings account to try to do things that should not have been done. Rainy Day Fund. So we all know that over the last couple of years, we've seen a hard time in our ag sector. Uh, farm incomes have been cut about half since 2012, 2013. And that's the biggest part of our economy. And so that means we've seen that impact at the state with our revenues going down. In fact, uh, of the previous two years, we actually saw, uh, well, actually not this year, but the year before, we saw our revenues go down. And that means we all had to tighten our belts. And part of the way we made our, our budget work was by borrowing from the rainy day. Day fund. In fact, we actually put more money back in this year because our revenues actually exceeded forecasts. But what that represents is that commitment to the property tax credit relief fund and delivering the property tax over $840 million in my budgets. That's direct dollar for dollar property tax relief from the state to all property owners in the state. And that was a priority in my budget. Correspond? Sure. Um, Actually, the money that went back into the rainy day fund had nothing to do with the governor's budget or the legislative budget. It is an automatic trigger. When we make so much money, it goes back into the rainy day. And that was put uh, in place many, many years ago by uh, Governor Johans and then modified by Governor Heineman. And having been there 10 years, I understand that we have to continue to do that. I will tell you in 2009, when we were faced with a billion dollar budget cut, the only money we had left in our rainy day fund was the money that came from the federal government, about $250 million. We cannot sustain another Thank hard you, time with this kind of, of a rainy day. We have to move on. We have a, a reader question. It's from 29-year-old Brandon Besh. He wants to know who is the biggest funder of your campaign. Senator Chris, your two biggest donors are Philip Perry, a Lincoln businessman, and the State Teachers Union. Why should we not think that the funder's support would not unduly influence your policy choices? Right. Well, um, when you talk about large funders uh, coming into my campaign, uh, obviously when we do grassroots, you could have given me five or $10,000 and it could be huge. So that kind of money is not going to influence me to turn one cheek or the other. 
Uh, secondly, it is not all about who gives you money in a campaign. It's about the things that you believe in your core. And if education isn't a core value around the state, particularly for uh, what we've seen lately in the underfunding in K through 12, as well as the university being cut, then we should take notice about where our core values are and where the funding should come from. Thanks for the question. It's a great question, but it's not all about sometimes the small amounts of money. It's about funding a campaign from a grassroots level. Governor, same question to you. Uh, your two biggest donors are your parents, Joe and Marlene Ricketts, and uh, Rick Sinkfield, a businessman from, uh, Rick, excuse me, Sinkfield from Missouri. Why should we not think that their donations would not unduly influence your policy choices? Well, okay, my biggest donor is my mom and my dad. It's because they love me, right? So that's one of the reasons why they're doing that. Uh, and Rex is somebody who, uh, you know, shares my philosophical uh, belief that we need to make sure we're running government more like a business. That's the whole point of why I ran and why people, I think, elected me, is to bring my private sector skills to running state government more like a business. And that's what we've been doing. We've been implementing better process and better technology so we can actually do a better job of serving our customers while we're controlling costs at the same time. And that's been really important because, as I mentioned, our revenues were down. So we had to go in and tighten our belts. So even though some of my agencies took big cuts, we were still able to serve the people we're supposed to in areas like health and human services, so, you know, child, children and family services, our behavioral health, all those places. We look for ways to do a better job serving our customers despite our budget constraints. So that's why I think that those people supported me, is because they wanted me to do a better job with how we were running the government, and they sa shared those same philosophical beliefs to do that. That's what we've been doing to help us grow Nebraska. We're getting the job done. All right, next issue, uh, and this question is for you, Governor Ricketts. College affordability continues to be a challenge for Nebraskans. What role should the state play in making sure that young Nebraskans can afford to go to college and come out with student debt loads that are manageable? Yeah, certainly one of the things that's really important to being able to be successful in life is getting that great education. Though it doesn't necessarily always involve having to get that four-year degree. In fact, one of the things we've really highlighted in my administration is working with uh, the private sector and schools, really letting a lot of our young people know there's great careers out there that may only require a two-year degree. And that may lead into getting that four-year degree. Uh, as you all know, the University of Nebraska is an important institution because that's where a lot of our young people get, get uh, trained here and get that, their education in our state. But the University of Nebraska is run separately. It's run by a board of regents, it's got its own management, and it doesn't report to the governor. So when we go through these tough economic times, we've asked them to tighten their belts just like we've had to do, and they need to manage that to be able to serve the people, the students that they're serving. And that's what we need to do, is just all kind of pitch in to be a part of the issue so that we can just continue to serve the people of Nebraska. That's what we focused on in my administration, on my agencies, is how we tighten our belts and still do a better job, just like I was describing before. Uh, the university has to do that, the state college system has to do that, community colleges, everybody who gets money from the state has to be a part of that solution. All right, Senator Christ, college affordability. Absolutely. Um, I think it starts, first of all, with uh, the dual credit programs that we have um, seen put in place by our community colleges and our high schools. Uh, we can, as the governor ha has as eloquently said, uh, not everyone is going to a four-year college or institution. So we give them the opportunity to decide whether they want to go into a technical field, decide whether they want to be a welder or uh, a, uh, work on machinery. Uh, then it's past the community college level, will those credits transfer? And I worked extensively the last few years to make sure that the credits in a, in a community college or our, our state colleges will transfer to the university at some point because it's very important. Um, but I'm going to address a little bit about one of the gover governor's comments here. Um, he said that in his administration, everyone had to tighten their belts and take a hit. Um, my words, not his. Um, I'll remind the governor that while the rest of us were taking uh, large amounts of hit, his personal office expenses, his budget, went up 5.5% in the last two years. So I would lead by example, first of all, to make sure that we're all taking the same amount of hit, if that indeed is where we're going to be. But what we've done is cut $48 million in 18 months and raised tuition by $5,000 a kid. That's not the way to get to where we need to get to. All right, Governor Ricketts, you want to reply to that? Yeah, a couple things. Uh, one, I want to just tell one quick story. I met a guy from Miller Electric. He started off in the union, went to Metro Community College, got a one year, or for one year, got his associate's degree, 
Started working for Miller Electric, took advantage of the tuition reimbursement, got his bachelor's, now he's working on his MBA. He got a $153,000 education for about $24,000. That's the kind of opportunities we have out there. Uh, with regard to my office, again, we've been controlling expenses. We have uh, eliminated positions in my office. We've asked all of our agencies to take a look at how they can tighten their belts, and we've done that. We've actually reduced the growth of government by over 90%. It was growing at 6.5% before I took over. This budget that I signed a few months ago, 0.5%. Thank you, Governor. We're going to move on. Senator Chris, over the years, you've changed your position on several issues, uh, including tax credits for private school tuition, uh, death penalty, and even your party affiliation. Why should Nebraskans trust that an office will do what you say? I think when you're exposed to any decision, uh, I think, the, I, and I've told folks who are coming into the legislature, the worst thing, thing I think you can do is walk in the door and think you know everything about everything. You need to listen to the facts, you need to digest the facts, and you need to make an educated decision. I've had some, some uh, life-changing events in, in my life that have caused me to rethink the way that, that I move forward with, with many issues. Um, and, and the governor has too. For example, the governor thought that when we passed the uh, increase in uh, road to in uh, uh, fuel tax to to fund roads, uh, he was adamantly against it. He lobbied against it. He brought us all in, and I was one, and said, "Don't vote for this. This is an increase in tax." Well, we passed it, and then he vetoed it, and then we overrode the veto. Something I learned from the process is we need to have consensus and build and move forward, and yet. Today, I'm sure he believes in it because he's going all over the state saying it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. So we all learn from things. We all learn because of our life experiences. And just because we change our mind for good reason, um, I think we shouldn't be judged adversely. May I respond to that? Yes. So the senator did vote to raise your gas taxes 23 percent and over, voted to override my veto because I do not want to raise your taxes. I think we're a high tax state already. We need to be reducing our taxes, not expanding our taxes. Now, once I was overridden in that, I was determined not to let that money go into things that you wouldn't want. So we created the Transportation Innovation Act to direct that and ex accelerating the work on our expressway system. And I might point out, not only did Senator Chris vote to raise your taxes, in other bills like this LB-468, he actually tried to rip off Rhodes' money. In fact, he wanted to get rid of uh, Senator Fisher's Build Nebraska Act and put that into general fund spending. I will not allow that to happen. Can I respond? Yes, mm -hmm. certainly. Yes. Um, the vote that I, I cast in order to turn around what Senator Fisher had done was simply to remind and to uh, accentuate the point that the formula as it exists, because of the, the increased fuel mileage that cars are getting, we need to look at how that process is put together. Everything is not black and white, folks. Everything needs to be analyzed and moving forward. And I never voted for a 23% tax increase in gases, in gas tax. Uh, I, what I voted for was the, the gas tax that went into place. And by the way, at least 44 of my colleagues voted the same way uh, in, in the legislature. Governor Ricketts, uh, you've uh, been in office and you're the highest ranking officer in state government. You are one of the most influential donors. You spent $300,000 of your own money to reinstate the death penalty, and you have contributed to legislative races. Why should the average Nebraskan feel like their views are being represented in state government when one person has so much power over the process? Well, I would say, first of all, one of the things that I do when I'm out talking to people and I travel all across the state is I tell them what we're doing. I did it on the campaign. I've done it as governor. So I communicate out to everybody, here's what we're going to do. Now, you may not always agree with me, but you're not going to be surprised by what I do because I tell you what I'm going to do and then I do it. So if you agree with me, then generally you appreciate the fact that I support conservative candidates, that I support causes, and I've done that since before I was governor as well. And I'm going to continue to do it. And you know, you talked about some of my contributions, but that pales in comparison to what the unions have put in. Uh, in the last election in 2016, the NSEA put in almost a half a million dollars through its organization and other shell organizations to elect candidates. So I'm not going to apologize for representing conservative viewpoints and conservative people when they want to see conservative people elected. That's kind of what you know we're all about in the system is trying to make sure that the people that we appreciate, the people that share our values, 
get into office. So that's what I do. And again, nobody's going to be surprised by what I'm doing because I go out and tell everybody before they have the chance to vote for me. All right. It's time for our second commercial break. When we come back, more issues, including medical marijuana. You're watching the debate for governor on KMTV 3 News Now and the Omaha World Herald. And welcome back to the debate for governor as we continue to delve into the issues. The first question up when we're back is uh, to, to Governor Ricketts. President Trump has increased tariffs on imported steel and aluminum, prompting new tariffs and threats of tariffs from American trading partners. The effects are being felt by Nebraska farmers and manufacturers. What would you do to help Nebraskans on this issue? The vision for my administration is to grow Nebraska, and that means create more and better paying jobs, keep our kids and grandkids here, and make sure they can find their careers in our state. Agriculture is our biggest segment, and so if we're going to grow Nebraska, we have to grow agriculture. And so when it comes to the matter of tariffs, that creates a lot of issues for us. And so what I have done is stay in constant communication with the Trump administration on how those tariffs, whether it's on agriculture or on the steel tariffs, so that they know how it's impacting us here in Nebraska. So for example, in June, I led a group of ag leaders to meet with our ag secretary, Sonny Perdue, to talk about tariffs. In July, I was talking with Commerce Secretary Ross about the steel tariffs and how it's impacting our manufacturers here, driving up the cost for their steel. And then this month, I was talking to Ambassador Lighthizer about the trade deals, and every time, encourage him, guys, get these deals wrapped up so that we don't see further impacts to our folks here in Nebraska. And of course, what we saw this past week is that the Trump administration has announced a deal with Mexico. That's great news. That's a great start for us here in Nebraska. Now what we'd like to see is continue to do that with Canada and NAFTA and our other trade partners so that we don't see that impact here in Nebraska. Same question to you, Senator Chris. What would you do? Well, as, as a state senator, um, I, and I've watched this happen, I think that Governor Johans, Governor Heineman, and Governor Ricketts have uh, done most everything that they can do to advocate for the state of Nebraska and for our farmers. Um, however, uh, the the uh, Governor's Association uh, and, and the coalition that can be built uh, from ag producing states I think has been underutilized. Um, I honestly believe that going one on one with uh, secretaries or the president if the governor is suggesting that he has done that um, is maybe not as effective as building consensus and coalition with the states who are also affected in this way, Democrat, re Republican, independent governors who are facing the same situation. Um, there are strength in numbers, and I believe a coalition would be more effective. Um, I'm disappointed that the governor hasn't been more communicative with the, the farmers and ranchers around the state in terms of what he's done, because my sense in traveling around the state is that they don't feel like anyone is speaking for them. So I would certainly speak for them. May I respond? Yes, yes. respond. So we have actually created some of those coalitions that the Senator was talking about. So when we had our Republican Governors Association meeting in Austin last year, we actually had all the Republican governors there talking with him. The top topic was trade. Uh, and so you, he heard, the Vice President rather heard from all the governors with regard to what that was going to be doing, how that was going to impacting us, and then we followed up with an, a meeting with them afterwards. Uh, we also had a meeting with the President in March at the White House with a number of Midwest agricultural leaders as well. Governor Kim Reynolds from Iowa is there, Doug Burgum from North Dakota, plus different senators, some congressmen. So those coalitions that the Senator is talking about, we've done that as well. And if I haven't done a good job of communicating that out, you know, that is something we need to focus on doing a better job. All right, moving along, uh, next question, and it's for you, Governor Ricketts. Uh, pretty simple. Do you support the legalization of marijuana for medical purposes? So what I think that all drugs should do is go through the FDA process. This is how we determine whether or not drugs are safe and effective and what quantities for what ailments and make sure there's no unintended consequences or unintended side effects. And that people know about those when they take that drug if there are. And that's what marijuana needs to do as well. It needs to go through that process. So I oppose what has happened in some states where they try to go around that process and really, frankly, are endangering the, the public by making marijuana legal without going through the FDA. And in fact, there are drugs or derivatives of marijuana that are going through the FDA right now. And to help make sure we get some more information on that, I actually supported a bill, which the state of Nebraska then funded for the UNMC, our medical center here in the state, to be able to help do some of that research to determine how, what could be medical derivatives of marijuana. So that's really the process it needs to go through. It needs to go through the one that we've established for all sorts of other drugs that we use and we know are safe and effective. It has to go through that FDA process. Senator Christ. 
Um, I supported the uh, petition. Um, I will vote for uh, medical marijuana when it comes on to the ballot in November. Um, I have a special needs daughter who is surrounded by uh, folks who, are, who suffer from seizures and other ailments. And medical cannabis uh, in many forms, and some of them, if Senator or uh, Governor, have been approved by the FDA and are being used across the United States, several. Uh, it is an, it's an amazing drug that, that, that brings um, brings the, the, the unintended consequences and the bad side effects of some of the process under control. And let me remind you that we have an opioid epidemic in this country. Uh, and instead of narcotics, we have a natural cure in our medical cannabis. Now we have some problems, and I did vote for the research done by UNMC, and they have done a great job. We have problems with efficacy, dosage, and distribution. But you know what? We've got states out there that have solved that problem. And as governor, I will make sure that we expeditiously bring medical cannabis into force. Senator, we're going to stay with you with an urban-rural question. Um, obviously, in Nebraska, there are two very different economies. You have a rural and urban areas. What's your best approach to economic development to address the needs of both? Uh, folks, the reality is that having been in the legislature for 10 years, I can tell you that term limits did not do us any favors when it comes to building coalition and consensus. And many times senators are either thrown out or they're voted out or they don't spend the full eight years there. I was lucky enough to have ten, two appointed and two of my own. Uh, those senators who have been there for a long period of time understand how to get things done and further built consensus where the urban-rural divide was less uh, impactful than it is today. Um, I would bring in urban rule, and we would start with things that we all need, property tax relief. That's what this election is about, property tax relief. And we can't do that without talking about education, and we can't talk about education without trusting that our institutions are doing what they need to do to educate our children, both in K through 12 and higher education. Those are the common base things that we need to build consensus on and move forward. This is about property tax relief tax restructuring across the board. Governor, same question to you. Uh, urban, rural, obviously, how do you work to make sure both of them are taken care of? So one of the things we've done in my administration is focus on a strategy that grows Nebraska, the entire state. And you can see this reflected in things such as our transportation priorities, where we focused on not only Omaha with repaving Maple Street or the Lincoln South Beltway, but also doing things such as making the highway, Highway 83 from McCook to North Platte a Super 2 highway or making 275 between Scribner and West Point a four-lane highway. And we're being rewarded. We actually have won the Governor's Cup here in Nebraska two years in a row for the most economic development projects per capita of any state in the nation. In fact, for the last two years, we've had more projects than North Dakota, South Dakota, and Kansas combined. And if you look at that list of those projects, they are in areas in Omaha and Lincoln, but also in other parts of the state as well. Another thing we can do to be able to help do that is make sure that we've got strong RFS, ethanol. Those creates jobs in our small towns and rural communities. It's responsible for about 1,300 direct jobs and all sorts of spinoff jobs from that. So that's another great way that we can make sure we're doing this all across our great state. All right, Governor Ricketts, uh, moving on to the next topic. Can, uh, can the Senator respond to that? Or you can I respond Did you want to respond? Yes, sure. please. Um, we had a four-lane project that was designed in the mid-90s and it was supposed to be completed in 2003 at a cost of a half a billion dollars. That project has now been extended to 2033, and that is just stage one. That's going to cost us $2.5 billion to get there. The reason is that we build when we're good, and we don't build when we're not. I would advocate a judicious use of bonding, which will keep our folks working and keep this project on place. That four-lane project will do more for safety and for connecting our small towns around this state than any other economic development we have. All right. Uh, you've touched on this, uh, Senator Christ, a couple of times in the debate, uh, but this question is for you, Governor Ricketts. Should the state provide a basic level of funding for every K-12 through student in Nebraska, no matter how much property wealth a school district has? Or should state school aid focus on districts with the least property wealth and greatest student need? So the idea of basic funding that Craig was talking about there, let me explain that just for a moment. What that means is that we have a school aid formula that we give aid to different school districts. 
Right now, because of rising values on ag land, ag land valuations have gone up 252% over the last 10 years, I mean, quick math, 25% a year, a lot of our rural school districts are no longer receiving that equalization aid. In fact, of our 244 school districts, only about 70 school districts are actually getting that equalization aid. And so the idea is to make sure that there are dollars in that school aid fund that would go to every child in the public school system. And that's actually an idea I talked about with Senator Groney and Speaker Scheer a couple of years ago. Now Senator Groney is the chair of the Education Committee. Obviously, Speaker Scheer is uh, now the speaker. And that is an idea I do support, is to make sure that every child gets some of those dollars that are coming into that school aid formula in a way to make that system more fair and so that every school district is participating in that school aid formula. Senator Christ. Sure. We had uh, five bills in the Revenue Committee last year. Um, four of them did not even come out to the floor for discussion. The only one that came out was the governor, uh, governor's bill that was introduced on his behalf, which, again, would have put $13 million back in some corporate pockets so that would give $25 to you. The other four also concerned themselves with education because you can't talk about property tax without talking about funding education. One of other bill came out of the... Uh, education Committee. It was Senator Friesen's bill. And it introduced the concept, again, what we had 30 years ago, of foundation funding. It does not create a have and have not. It gives foundation funding across the board to all of our school districts. I was in a meeting uh, a few nights ago, and uh, the, the equalized versus non-equalized school districts is going to come back to haunt us if we don't do something about the TIOSA formula as, as it currently exists. The 10 years I've been there, there's always been people, and the governor and Senator Groney are, are some of those people who have said, demonizing education, they're spending too much, we've got to cut down on education. Folks, that's not what it's about. It's about revenue in the state. We've got $800 million of tax offsets that have reduced the revenue coming into the state. That's what it's about. It's a revenue side. 30 seconds, Governor, to reply on this. When the senator, senator is talking about education, I would like to point out that in my budgets, we've actually funded K-12 education at four times the rate that the state budget is growing. We have made that a priority in my administration. And we continue to work on different bills, like a third grade reading bill. We've signed uh, a regulation that allow active military spouses to come into our state and get a teaching certificate for three years so they don't have to go through all that rigmarole to make more teachers available. We've also worked on the Developing Youth Talent Initiative to help our students there. So we've done a number of things to be able to help improve education here in our state, and we have made that a priority in my administration. All right, next question, uh, Governor Ricketts. Do you think the state should make any changes to voting laws, like adding a voter ID requirement or automatically registering people to vote? <laughs> You know, this is an issue that comes up periodically, and frankly, it really hasn't made it to my desk uh, with regard to um, voter ID laws or anything like that. I do think that we need to be careful with regard to the security of our voting system, and so I would support a voter ID law. You'd have to make sure that you do it in a way that it doesn't disenfranchise people, that it doesn't impact the people who are going to try to vote. So it has to be done thoughtfully. And we've seen in other states where they've implemented these, uh, these sorts of laws have been upheld in court. But you do have to make sure you implement it in a way that is going to be very carefully done. And frankly, as I said, none of the bills that have been introduced so far have really gotten very far. So I haven't had a chance to take a look at it in detail. All right, Senator Chris, same question. Sure. Uh, ten years I've uh, either debated this or voted uh, one way or another on it a half a dozen times at least. None of those were quality pieces of legislation in, in my mind. They all were uh, gloom and doom and created the atmosphere of distrust, mistrust, and, and really none of it would have funded the, the IDs that uh, would have to be put in place. So in that respect, I would agree with the governor. However, I would not support uh, the voter ID um, uh, process unless and if uh, what John Gale has suggested, Secretary Gale has suggested on many times, is upgrading the equipment that we use for the election process. That needs to be priority number one. Once, those, once the, the, the vehicles by which we vote are upgraded and the technology is upgraded, we'll see better security within our voting system. That's the first step. Senator, we stay with you talking about brain drain, keeping young people, talented people here in the state. What can the state do to make Nebraska and its employers more attractive to young people? Well, I think we're doing part of it. Um, let's take the University of Nebraska Medical Center for one. 
uh, attracting people who are bringing uh, research dollars with it and also graduate students that stay here out of the med medical education process. I think that that is a, a step in the right direction. I think that we're, we now have to realize that we are at structural unemployment. That means that anything we bring into this state, we're going to have to make sure we bring employees into the state to, uh, uh, to work in these, in these institutions. I think the, the biggest thing for us is to make sure that we have a pathway for a young man or a young woman to get from the high school level to wherever they get to, and some of that is going to be on the technical side. A lot of it's going to be on the technical side. So the brain drain and, and, and the accommodation for people as well. Um, I, I support the, the efforts of the city council in Omaha to respect workplace uh, equality for everyone. I think that's a big ba uh, barrier for brain drain in the state. Governor, how do we stop brain drain from the state of Nebraska? Well, this has really been the vision for what we've been doing in my administration, Grow Nebraska. And there's four key things we focus on to be able to do that. The first is developing our people. And that, makes sure, that means helping them make sure they get into those job and career fields. So for example, I mentioned the Developing Youth Talent Initiative. That's a program starting in seventh and eighth grade to help young people see about the great careers that we have available in you know, manufacturing and logistics and computer coding and those sort of things that may not require that two-year degree. Making sure we're training up our own people. We also work to make sure those folks then also are able to uh, get a job through our Department of Labor. We focus on making sure that we are cutting the red tape so we're easy to do business with the state. That we are also then managing our budget so we can provide tax relief and make sure our companies are more competitive that time. And then finally, we've got to go out and promote the state. So that's why I go on trade missions where I'll go to, I've been on seven of them so far as governor. We've got a great opportunity having about, uh, you know, a couple hundred Japanese and uh, business executives as well as people from out of state coming here next month for our Midwest U.S. Japan Association. So those four key things are what we've been focused on to be able to deliver on that promise to grow Nebraska. Senator Chris, you wanted to jump in. Sure. Um, I think what the governor's uh, doing in, in terms of describing the process that the legislature and he haven't, haven't been involved with the last few years is fantastic. But we also have, we have to put the money into workforce development. Uh, there were a group of us that, that tried to get $30 million invested in this past year, past biennium, in workforce development. And the governor put it down to five and then eventually started to negotiate trying to get his bill out of committee. But workforce development is probably right on top of the list when you talk about stopping brain drain in the state. May I respond to that? Yes. 30 seconds. Absolutely agree. Workforce development has had to be key. Again, my opponent voted against that bill. And that $5 million, well, that's what we could fit within our budget. We have to live within our means just like every Nebraska household does. So we've got to manage our budget so that we don't overspend. And that's what that reflected is how much we could afford. I also want to mention that we are being recognized, I mentioned the Governor's Cup, how we've won that two years in a row, but we also have the third highest wage growth here in our state since 2014. We've got the seventh lowest unemployment rate. We've been recognized by Forbes as being the fourth best state for business. We are getting that recognition. It is working and we're going to continue to drive that in my administration. Governor, you continue to say that I voted against bills. Now, let's be clear and let's be fair about it. I voted against a bill that included a lot of bad stuff and workforce development that was unfunded. So whether I voted against it or not needs to be weighed and measured about what the content was of that bill. Still a great bill. All right, let's leave it right there. Time for our final break. When we come back, the candidates and their closing statements. You're watching the debate for governor. This is Nebraska, and this is how Nebraskans play. Teamwork, sacrifice, determination, excitement, frustration, triumph, and defeat. News Channel Nebraska covers it all. The best high school and college games year round. This is Nebraska. This is
Welcome back. It's time for closing statements. Each candidate will have 90 seconds. Governor Ricketts, you're up first. I thought actually, according to the drawing, I thought the senator was supposed to go first. Am I not right? I, I have it up. We had the to, senator doesn't mind. I'll go first. We have you going first. Okay, very good. Well, folks, thank you again for being here today. And again, I want to thank my lovely wife and my family, Lieutenant Governor, everybody who's here today. Folks, the vision for my administration, as I've said, is to grow Nebraska, create more and better paying jobs, keep our kids and grandkids here, and help people from across the country move to Nebraska so we can continue to grow our great state. And I talked about the four things that we focus on to do that by developing our people. One of the other quick stories there is we've got job coaches in our Department of Labor that have helped people who are unemployed get back into the workforce faster. We're also taking those job uh, coaches and now we've offered them to our families that are on the food stamp program so they can get better jobs and it's working. Then we also work to cut the red tape so companies can come here and get their business done and therefore invest and create jobs. And then, of course, finally, or uh, two more things, we got to make sure we continue to control our spending and provide tax relief. I've introduced tax relief, working with the legislature every year I've been governor, property tax relief. First year, we've increased, uh, increased the property tax credit relief fund. Now we've increased it over 60%. But other ideas as well, in fact, the most recent, 20% cut of your property taxes. Folks, this election is about choices and contrasts. My opponent has been in the legislature for 10 years. And the only bill he ever introduced on property taxes in 10 years, even though this has been a problem for a while, was to actually raise your property taxes. On the average home, it would have been about $263. He has also been on uh, the opposite side of Nebraskans on a lot of issues we've discussed here today, like the death penalty, but also on things like illegal immigration. It is a choice we make in every election, and I ask for your vote. Thank you very much, and God bless. 90 seconds to you, Senator. Please don't applaud. First of all, uh, I'd like to bring to your attention uh, a lady up front who's running as my lieutenant governor, um, who is a state senator, uh, Senator Lynn Walls. She and I don't always agree on everything, and that's good because we make a perfect team. But one thing we do agree on is service. Service to your country, service to your community, service to a greater cause. 21 years I spent in the Air Force in service to my country and in peacetime and in war. 10 years in service in the legislature. And I'll stand behind my record, even though the governor doesn't like it. Um, I, I'm pretty proud of it. I don't make excuses in moving forward, but I can tell you that I'm running for governor because the state of the state is not as good as I think it should be, as we think it should be. We have wards in the state, wards of the state who are being killed, who have died in, in our custody. We are their parents, have been sexually abused. We have retirement homes that have closed down for lack of funding. We have a correction system that is in a debacle. It's in worse shape now than the four years before. We have education funding that is sometimes good, sometimes not good. We have tuition increases in the university that have gone up $5,000 for a four-year degree because of $48,000 cuts in 18 months. Wrap it up if you would. I have Senator. a vision too. And it is to, for you to allow us to continue our service and my service to this state. I ask you, I humbly ask you for your vote on November 6th. Thank you, Senator. Senator, thank you very much. Governor, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us for Michael Sevier. I'm Craig DeGrelli.